Okay, right. So I've got a nail in there and a nail in there and I'm going to set this up in the middle. And it could be anything, it could be on a... You could be doing it against a couple of manholes or a curb stone or anything. And what you're trying to do is find out, as I say in there, the, how good the level is. All right. A nail. Are they tiny? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, wow, okay. I did see that, but isn't it large Yeah. So when you come back here, yeah, well, because you don't want to trip people tripping over it or pulling it out. Did you get that in the trunk? Bash it, it in. Pardon? Do you have a responsibility to take that out? If somebody wants to take it out, we would do. But the thing is, that if you come back here years later to do a survey, that's the problem. That one had disappeared and I had to reinstate it so that I could see in there. Um, so when they asked for this survey with the ramp and the bits up the side, that had gone. And this one over here, that hedge was in the way, so I couldn't see through. So I had to put something here, which is why I resected myself, found the hole, banged in the nail, checked it all and then I went forward and continued with the survey. Is it a particular kind of nail? It's a hilti nail it's called hilti so it's nail. it's have probably... You ever, have you ever got in trouble with a client who's got a noise that he's stuck nails with? In roofs yeah when, when I'm banging them in roofs. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah some, some people say you can't mark it and I say well I need to mark it so I can chalk it but if the chalk disappears I need something solid that I can come back and check it if there's any problems. So we managed to convince them, but quite often we'll put in a wooden peg with a nail in it, and then the client may say, "We need, to, you know, you're going to damage my lawnmower, so you need to go." But we normally put them flush with the ground. But then if you do that, you can end up disappearing. But it's hard to find them when you come back to site years and years later, because yeah. you look about, and think, "Is that it? Is that it?" Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you'll find one, you'll find three or four other ones, and that's dangerous because other people are coming to do a survey. They don't know that's there, they're banging another one, do the survey. It's quite odd that they're all within a couple of three metres of each other. So then when you've had assistants coming out surveying me, you say, go and put my nail over there, put the tripod over there. You do the survey and you go back to the office and it's wrong with that much. You think, what the flipping heck's gone wrong? Scratch, scratch. And he's put it over a different nail. So it didn't relate to the original survey that was done years ago. So you can have a real issue with nails. So the control points are very important. Is that your control? That's one of my control points. There's another one should be here. <laughs> nah. There's one around here somewhere. Oh, there's one. There it is. Wow. See, you're good. Oh, you are good. She's got the eyes. Right, this one over here now. Come on. Now, do you know the trouble is you're going to be looking for these everywhere. My wife actually starts doing it. She says, there's a survey station. I say, yeah, all right. <laughs> Where is it? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yay! Oh, well, that's sticking up a bit, that one. Yeah, well, I hooked a tape on that one. Oh, right, okay. Yeah? So that's the survey control point. But it can be a peg, it can be a nail, it can be what's known as a pipe nail. So we haven't got any pipes, but they use big, chunky with a big ring around it and they used to be used a lot in the day bashed in the ground that's quite permanent because it goes down about 100 mil into the ground all right mm -hmm. but you'll if you found that you'll be walking through the road and you'll be saying because sometimes they'll have a triangle around it with a number and you'll be saying survey point survey point <laughs> good good yeah things start to fall into place So this is the old dumpy level. Um, in the video, you can hear me. You hear the noise, the rattle. Yeah, yeah. That's. Make this a video? Do you mean us make a video? For people I'm making a video, and there's one over there videoing it as well. Oh. So that's an overall one, and this one will be for the visual, you know, for the the audio. So this has got a little bit of wire in here somewhere with a prism on it, and your line of sight goes through, hits the prism. 
and goes out and that's exactly, when it's level, that's exactly level, all right? And you press that button and it makes the pendulum swing. And when you look through the staff, you'll see it oscillate, which is the prism moving and you know it's level. If it doesn't move, then you've got a problem with the level. It needs to be adjusted or it's stuck with the cold weather or whatever, dampness. Some people tap them. I prefer, if it hasn't got a button, just to flick the foot screw and that makes the whole thing up and down. That's the level. So first thing first, if you're in soft ground, you would bash in your legs so it doesn't move. That goes on there. And then make sure they're finger tight, all right? Because you don't want anybody come up low and an old thing falls down. Because, you know, this is all right. This is 150, 200 pound. But you don't want anything that costs you a fortune. So, leveling it, that's at level. Didn't take me any time at all. I'm going to set the level staff over there first. I'm going to call that point A. So I'm going to put this off level and I want you to try and level it. You've determined it's level because there's a bubble in there. In there, right? Yeah, okay. And what you want to do is you want to get it square with either on line with one and 90 degrees so it's square with two. And if you use your thumbs, the bubble will always move to the left hand thumb. So if I go in, the bubble will move that way. And if I go that way, the bubble will move that way. When you're 90 degrees and the bubble's over this way, you want it to move that way, you move the thumb that way and the bubble will move that way. So that's how you do it. All right, so always use two on one, 90 degrees, and then just use left hand. So have a go at trying to level up while I set up the stuff. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a bit you missed that. Yeah. Bubbles off. Right. Right? Yes. yes. The bubble's the that bubble. side. Yeah. The level yeah, yeah, bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that way, level. right? Yeah. Can you see it? No. no. All right. We'll bring it down. <laughs> we'll bring it down. <laughs> right. Okay? Right. So the bubble's this side. Uh, right. I can't see any bubbles. So yeah, no, come around here. Oh. Right? Yeah, okay. So I want it to go that way. Why do you want it to go that way? So, it's in the middle. so get it in the middle. Okay, fine. So I get it perpendicular to that one. I'm going to move it, my thumb that way, and it'll move away from me. But it's going a little bit to the left, yeah? Yeah. So I can get it there. Then I'm going to use both foot screws and it'll move to that one. So I want it to go towards you. So go like that. Stop it, move it a little bit this way, bring it there. Job done. So is, is, are these uh, three controlling the, bubble, the uh, controlling That's the controlling this, the top of that. I thought this was the bubble I was saying. No, so have, it. I'll put it off level. So somebody try and level it again. Go on. You know you can do it. level yep sussed it but you're all experts now so Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh I've God, only got so one, yeah, one there. So the you need to share. Um, yeah. Or, no, like right, wait a minute, you can give this half. Give this so you can read what it says on it. So I'll take the top one. There you are. Um, 
So that tells you what we're going to do. All right. Okay, so you've leveled it up. I'm going to read it, right? And then I'm going to get you guys to look, look at it and remember what you're looking at, all right? Remember you're looking at the big cross there that goes all the way across the middle. And I'm going to book it the same as what it is, the instructions there. So I've got A, B and C, that's A, that's B. I'm going to sight back onto A. Then I'm going to sight forward to B. I'm going to move the instrument to there, read it within a meter, and then read that one. When you move it. And any error will be multiplied because the distance is one meter over 20 meters. So it'll be 20 times the error. All right? We'll see what it looks like. Which bit are you lining up with the nail? Uh, there's no nails on this. This is just arbitrary, it's anywhere, all right? But when, if you're using it with a circle, you're using it as a theodolite, so you're using it for angles, then you would set it up over a nail. But I'll explain that later, all right? So this, that's the start one, yeah. So this is slow motion, back and forward, and the big one is your focus. Now, I'm gonna focus it on that. I'm gonna focus the eyepiece so it's clear for me. This is the crosshairs, but you have, when you have a look, you'll look at it. If it's not crystal clear and fine, then you adjust that very slightly. So adjust that for the focus, adjust that for the crosshairs. And if you move your head left to right, and the image moves, it means you've got something known as parallax. And to get rid of parallax, is you focus in infinity and get the crosshairs as solid as you can and get come back to your object and check and it shouldn't move, all right? Because if you- Do this kind of thing to check somebody else's survey? Well, yes. If you had a level or you hired it in to check a survey, to do a survey, whatever you want, this is the first thing you would do with it because you need to prove the instrument's all right, right. and you need to prove that you know how to book it down. All right? So, onto the staff, focus. Uh, the crosshairs are quite good, so I'm going to leave them. I press the button. I don't touch the tripod or anything. Press the button and I've got my reading, all right? Which bit of the post are you looking at? I'm looking at the, the, that's the level crosshairs. staff. Well, you'll look, once you have a look at it, you'll see it. There's a big cross there in the middle, that's what you read. And remember, you're reading the meters, and then you're reading the decimeter, which is each chunk. So you've got an E one side, an E the other side. And then you're going to read the millimeters, which you're interpolating off that square. All right, so if you go to the next shot, so is it like you mean Another one then, maybe this, this, this bit, one, then this, this one. Bit, then this bit. So you're interpolating these bits. Yeah, massively. You could All right. Um, so I've read it now. You see what you get. Is this A or B? A. This is A. This is A. Right. So you got to read it to millimeters, right? <laughs> <laughs> Did you press the button to see the object move? I do that every time to make sure it doesn't stick. If you, it's not lined up, use this one to line it up. It's lined up, but it's it's slightly above the so the units that you can see. Yeah. So how do you guess how many millimeters? You you read the line that says one four, yeah. so it's one, one point four. four. Yeah. And then you're imagining that bottom block split up to millimetres, to 10 units. 10 units. So where is that line relative to the 10 uh, units? Is it like the middle? Is it the bottom? Is it the top? The bottom. Right, so, so what right. do you think it's going to be? Remember what you think it is. 1 millimetre, 14.1. Uh, 1401. 1401. Right. Well, that's, what, that's what I've got. Have you? Yeah. There you go. Nice! All right. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> Press, press the button. The button. Oh, make it wiggle. That's it. Do you see it? Do you oh, just yeah, see yeah, it yeah. floats? So it's leaning so on the floor. Oh, and then. Yeah. And what, but why is it 01? Well, it's 1. 1.4, but it's not above the first block, so it's still within uh, the so 0 okay, to yeah, yeah, 10 it. mil, or 0 to 9 mil.
Why do you, you press everything? press the button while you're looking through it and you'll see the object move. Oh, yeah. yeah? It's the pendulum. You don't want it to stick one way or that way or anyway because then the light's going a different path. Press the button so you can see it move. <laughs> It's showing you the difference in height between here and here. So okay. this is what's known as a collimation height, which is a height above that point to where the level is level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what you're doing is relatively seeing where it is on now. Okay. So as that measures 1.401, yeah, and then if I measured measure? this here, well, I've got and to take my bag. So our level is the difference. Yeah. Sorry? So our level then is the difference. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm like, otherwise it sounds like an arbitrary number. But no, it no. kind of is it's until you've made the difference. Until you've calculated it all. Because say this was 10 metres, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the height of collimation is 10.12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one is 10, is, is 1.4. Yeah. So because the staff is reading higher, it means the staff is going, the more it goes down, the, read, the reading will go higher and higher. So that is effectively, if that was 1.2, and that's reading 1.4, that's 200 millimetres lower into that the ground is, yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, I feel like a practical, like more of a practical person. Yeah, it that's right. And it'll make other things make sense. Make sense, yeah. And does it automatically measure this distance? No, no. you don't know. That's a shame. That well, you don't. Uh, well, if, yeah, that's. I don't get what I'm saying. If it's got a different reading because you've moved it lower, don't we need to know how where it is from here? Well, what we're doing is we're establishing levels for these nails first off, right? But this is checking the level, so. We know that the levels are good, that one's whatever it is and that one's whatever it is. And to be honest, that looks a little bit higher than that. So let's say it's 10 centimetres higher, all right? Right. So I set on there, I know it's 10 centimetres higher than that one. I read the back side to that. Then I can level things because it's relative to that, 10, that point that's 10, 10 millimetres, it's 10 centimetres higher. So it's all relative. So if I come off the floor level, read this to the floor level, I've got a reading, right? Yes. Of whatever, 1.2, 1.4. Yeah. I then read to that point, and I know what the difference is to the floor level to that point. Okay. And then I go to another point, and go to another point, and go to another point, and then change on this on a known point, a station or a screwdriver stuck in the ground. Set up the level again, do the same exercise, and when you've done, you come back to the start, that point of the floor level. And that's when you add everything up. Where do you and add that's that your closure. Where and that's your ac trying to get your accuracy. Where do you write your first thing? Well, I've written my first. I've A, B, and so A, B, A. A. And so this was which point? This, this was A. A. Yeah, yeah. And what did you, did you ever read it? Yeah, it says 1, 4 or something. 1, 4 something. Well, this is what you've got to interpolate. So if you look at another sheet on here. And this is backside, is it? Yeah. On that one. Yeah. So you're reading. One, well, it's 1.1, 1 .1, but you would have 1.4. Oh, yeah. Because you're not in the first centimetre, you're some way up, you're reading interpolating the millimetre, so it's 1.401, so the crosshair's just here. Does that make sense? Backside. Backside. Can I just, be just I know this is really anal, but so, so, so. that nail is a little bit well, out of the ground. Oh, right. yeah. Sitting on top, and that one's flat Flush. on the ground. Yeah. So there's we're talking about that much, yeah. I know, but we're talking about <gasps> Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> terrible, David. Two yeah. millimeters out. But we're not going to bash. Again. That one's been there forever. No, it's not moving. No, no. So it's relative to that. Okay. The problem arises if somebody comes along in the middle of the night with a big hammer and bashes that down. Then I've got a problem. Right, got you. Okay. Okay. So as long as that's stable, so a ground floor would be stable. A plinth line, a DPC line is stable. A nail driven into the ground. Yeah. Not to ref that one's the refusal, that one's not. But it's stable. So it's alright to base my levels on it. But yeah, get your point. So which one was which one back side? So staff point is A. Staff point. So that's the staff point is the nail. Yeah. One point four oh one, if that's what you read. Uh-huh. Right? And then I'm gonna move the staff to that point Can and I we're going to call it back. Height of collimation. The height of collimation is, <laughs> if, yeah. if that was set at 10 metres, yeah. I know that this instrument is 1.401, the line of sight 
that is there. We were talking about measurement of the ground. So yeah. that line of sight is 1.401 above that station. Yeah. So if that was 10 metres, yeah. your height of collimation is 11.401. So I could write 11.401 in there. Right? When I take this shot, and we're saying it's a little bit different, we'll have a reading in there. I can take that reading off of this height of collimation and that will give me a reduced level in there yeah, and yeah. we'll see what it is. Can you see if it, you know the orange? It'll, come, it'll persevere, right? Okay. It'll come to, sorry? That orange tripod. That's a dummy assistant. A dummy assistant. So it's like assistant that doesn't talk to me. Normally you would have a person holding it there nice and steady. Oh, okay. That looks more reliable. Well, it's quite difficult to hold it. Really 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 and the windy bit, yes, because like the wind will affect it. You don't yeah. know from, you know probably that way whether it's straight, but you don't know this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. So what you do is you move it back and forward slowly. And if you think about it, the further away that it would go, the higher the reading would be in there. Yes. And when it came forward, again, the higher the reading would be until it disappears off the end of the staff because it's lying on the floor. So if you oscillate it through a reasonable distance about that speed, you're looking through there, as long as you read the lowest level, because what it'll do is it'll come down to a point, it'll go back up and come down to a point and go back up. If you read that low level, that's it correctly vertical. So when you haven't got a bubble, when you haven't got somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, they want to rock the staff back and forward in your line of sight. You read the lowest level that you can, so you press the button and you read it and you've got to interpolate pretty quick because it's only going to be there for a short period of time before it moves away. Uh, yes, but if somebody come along they could push you over, the wind would blow over. So this is because I'm doing it myself. You wouldn't normally do that. You would have somebody holding it. And would you have a spirit level up against that to make sure that was... You can get a little bubble that you can sit in the back and it shows you. But again, you're only relying on how accurate is that. And what dictates the height of that tripod? Uh, nothing. That's just... It's got little extended legs. So can it can be anywhere it wants to be. Yeah, but you want it fairly stable. So it's the same idea as this, but a much more simpler version. I think I missed this but you, do, you, do you know how high that, that that's your start point? This is, this well no that's the start point like that. because that could be here or could be there okay. so the height of collimation what I'm observing doesn't matter where it is that is your start point that is the back side right. that's the station A this is immaterial for this exercise it will come into play later on okay come on let's do the next one then yeah <laughs> You just press the lines and then it'll unclamp it. Do you want me to carry one bit? Yeah. Oh, my pen. I keep losing that. Cheers. Yeah, maybe it needs a fatter one in there. Where's she going? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but this is, this is for this exercise. Right, so this is a little bit of a pain. Yeah. Yeah, so you want the teeth going this way, angle. right? So it sits in the edge, and then unclamp the thing so that it goes on there. Yeah, no, that and then you probably want great. it. No, you want probably want it that way a bit. No, no. So just twist that. No, well, you could do that. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's better. And what's it like that way? That's not bad that it's way not either. Bad, I reckon. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Top marks to you. No, that'll be all right. See? Yeah. All right. That'll be fine. Right, so now you've got to read that, yeah? And you do two things. One is you check the level bubble's still on. It yeah. should be still, yeah. And press the button and read it. Focus it and read it. Well, it comes to, it's E14. It's a bit blurry, but anyway. Well, blurry, get, do this then. This one. To focus it. Oh, that's better. <laughs> right. This is on yeah. the bottom E. It's yeah. on the bottom of the top line. Right. So you press the button. Right. Let. Right. So you try and imagine the millimeters bit, and I'll tell you what the other bits are. I think it's bang on the line. Is it? It's magic. I think so. Press it again. 
Yeah, it's nice and it's furry. Yeah, it's cosy. You look strokeable, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. A bit on the line, I think. Okay. But I don't know what number, I don't know what that is. Oh yeah, no, I'll give you that. So it's 1.4, it's not the fi it's not the top of the E, so it's not the, the bottom, five. The bottom of the top one there. So it's four, because if you count them up, you get one. <laughs> so you get zero, one, two, three, four. 1.440. Okay. Does that make sense now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bottom of the top one of the That's four sides. 1.440. Because there's no millimetres. No. 1.4 and you're up the you. bottom of the fourth bit. So if I take that off of there now, which is the height of the collimation, I've got one, four from that is six, five from the four is a nine, the two from the 11 is nine. That station value now is 9.961. That one was 10 meters, because that was a start point. So that nail is 39 higher. mil lower than, oh, no. no, sorry. Higher. That's yes, lower. that yeah, that's yeah. lower. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is it? Yes. Isn't it higher? Yes, that looks higher to me. No, no you got it at the wrong place. Point four one to one point four. No. Right there. Because you're looking forward. Oh, foresight. Oh. This is what I did in the video. See? Mm. Make mistakes. It's dead easy to do it. And then what? No, do no, you it's do? on the next line down because you're looking at B. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. We've got more paper. <laughs> No, no, you're on B, so you write B there, because we're sighting on A oh, first, right. I've then written it B. all the puzzle places and finally you have. it right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. 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 And then how do we work out the difference? I mean, obviously we just do the minus, but where do we write the difference? Well, if I was saying that point there was 10 metres, my reduced level is 10 metres, my height of collimation is the 10 metres plus that, and to find out what the reduced level for that one is, I take that away from the height of collimation. All right? Because okay. it tells you under there, look, equals right level plus back sight, height of collimation minus foresight or intermediate sight. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, what are you asking? Where would you write that then? Is that, it's the reduced level, because this is higher, um, here. Well, what I've done is I've started with 10 metres on that one, right? The height of collimation. I just chose 10 metres. All right, okay. So I write 10 metres here, yeah. and then this is and then you add 10, 10, to this. 10 metres. 10 metres, that's the height of collimation is 11.401. Right. So that's the height of that level oh, that's oh, why you relative to that station. Oh, one. Yeah. Would you always pick 10 as a reduced level? Well, you could, I could have used the floor level in there, 10, and then take a level on there and a level on there to find out the difference to adjust that. Or I could have taken the real level off the survey, which might have but been sensible. Yeah, and used it as a datum point. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that would okay, have been a I good part. I'll do saying. that next time. Yeah, 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 okay. All right, and, and, that's uh, how, and then to get the height of that one, I take the foresight because it tells me um, that away from that gives me that. So it's height of column ratio, it's foresight or intermediate minus, I take it away from the height of column <coughs> So 1.440 away from 10 gives you 9.961. <coughs> Is that um, right? Mm, and you've just got them in there one. Mill, that one. Because yeah. that's why so you get confusion. So, because you've got your reduced level, which is the, the value of that station, and so we would but you haven't got the, the height of collimation, which is that goes in there. Minus 30. Sorry? So, what would we, if we were using this to check the survey, what would we actually look for? Well, to on, on the survey that we were right. Well, they will have a value on that station or somewhere round about there of that height. So, you, it should be if they've got a height, yeah, size. if you've got height there, they've got 39 mil. If it's 50 or 60 or 150, it's wrong. So Something's yeah, going yeah, on. Okay. So it should be within a few mil, yeah, right? Yeah. So has everybody looked through this to yeah. see what it looks like? Right, so now we're going to move it right next door to that. Oh, this? Yeah. Okay. How do we get the same height? Sorry? How do we get the same height? This is, is, the, this is the back sights and four sights. You're transferring the height of collimation along. How do we get this to identical height down You don't. There? Oh, right, okay. You don't. So.
this is where I drop my phone um, and basically we then set the instrument up and we set sighted back to point uh, B as a back sight and we got everybody to uh, try and hold a pen on it to find out what the reading was and it was 1.467 uh, and it's quite hard to read because uh, the instrument was quite close to the level staff but everybody had a go of it um, and questions were just about how we read it because one of them was concerned that they couldn't interpolate the levels. They saw the red blocks, but they didn't know that the white areas between it were the same uh, distance, i.e. 10, millime 10 millimetres. And you need to interpolate them to guesstimate where the crosshair is. And they were basically just chatting amongst themselves. So with the back sight on to B, and then once everybody's had a look at it and written down in the right columns because seemingly there was some mess up on where the um, where they were putting the figures you know they were getting the staff point in the wrong place and getting the back sites and intermediate sites and four sites in the wrong place so as soon as you set up the instrument your first shot is a back sight and then you will have a foresight to the forward point and then you will um, move the instrument and then sight back as the first point again. And everybody's just working out their um, readings and where to place them. And once we've done this, then I'll move the staff and the uh, support to point A, which was the start point. And what we're going to do after that is we're going to um, read the three stadia hairs to the bottom, middle and top um, and try and arrive at the distance uh, because then you can use it as, um, as opposed to trying to fix it from offsets or trilateration you can use the level staff to give you the distance by reading the, as I say, the bottom, the middle and the top. Take the bottom from the top, multiply it by 100 and will give you the distance from where the instrument is to where the staff is. And it's quite a quick way and then you just use your angles but you need to know where the point is where the instrument is which you would get by um, fixing it to detail um, or 90 degrees uh, but you need to fix that and then obviously have a an arrow, a reference object somewhere that you can establish so what I'm talking about there is if the um, instrument was closer to the level staff then um, you would have much more difficult uh, trying to read the figures the meters and the decimeters because you wouldn't be able to see any numbers so it's quite nice to have somebody to mark it up to show you what the readings are obviously the um, students will be able to fill in on any bits that are missing on what we talked about. I'm explaining to them that um, you know they need to get the brain round back sights and foresights because you know we've taken the back sight onto this point. We're now going to go forward to read point A and then we could move the instrument to go round the corner. And what I'm explaining to them is this is now probably 15 times, 20 times the error because we've got the instrument close to this one and then we're sighting far away. So we're sight within two meters of this one 
and probably within 20 metres of the other one, so it's 20 times the error. And once we sight the forward one, then we can work out by adding up the back sights and the four sights what the error should be, if any. And if it's wrong, we can adjust it. And there's a little Tommy bar on this particular instrument that you spin it round, and you can see in there there's a, a, a little small screw that you, once you've found out what the error is, you move it up and down. Um, my elbow into the instrument there was stating that if you had it bashed, you know, somebody was asking, do you have to do this all the time, every shot? And I said, no, only when you buy the instrument, if it's the first time you use it, or it's the first particular job you're on, you would need to use it, um, just to ensure that it's not been, um, it's an adjustment. But if you're using it um, and you look after it, then there's no need to do this. It can be done in every type of job. Um, now the excitement is that we're moving the staff forward to point A. Um, and I'm going to help just to set it all up. But basically, the, um, if, you've used, if you're using the instrument and you don't mishandle it, you know, bash it about, it drops or whatever, then it should be in, it should be in good working order. So this two peg check is only going to be needed to be done once per job um, or once every now and again if you own the instrument and you use it sensibly. It's not something you need to do time and time again. So everybody's disappeared off the, off the um, area of interest now and once we set that up over the point then they'll all nip back in here to read the level to see what it is going forward. But it's certainly a nice day today. I thought it was going to be frosty and cold, but it was actually quite pleasant out there. Uh, here we're on our way back now. So I'll read it first and then book it down as I foresight onto station A. So people get in the way. That's what happens when you get lots of people around you. So sight the level. Reading it focus it and it's 1.430 and then I'll try and get everyone else to have a look at it and see if they come up with the same reading and then I'll get them to um, put it uh, right in the right column somebody just noticed there was the bubble all right on the instrument it was a little bit out and providing it said within the circle or at just touching the circle it's all right because the compensator the wire and the prism and the compensator uh, will compensate for it being a little bit out of level but all I did was just slightly adjust it to move it back onto the bubble to move the bubble in the middle of the circle and away we went but the idea of the pressing the button is to move the pendulum and um, to settle the height or the level and the line of sight, which is the line of collimation, uh, to give us a correct reading. So they're now all having a look at it. And uh, it works out. It, the back sights adding up are 2.863, and the four sights are adding up as 2.870, so it's two millimetres which is fine because what we're saying then is you've got a two millimetre error over um, 20 metres, um, which is negligible. So the instrument is in adjustment, it's fine, and doesn't need to be adjusted. But if there was an error, you would use that little screw to adjust the crosshairs to um, correct it and then do the exercise again so that you can prove that you get zero zero or as close to it as you possibly need. Did we did have trouble with some people booking it in the wrong place, you know, booking the back sights with the four sights and the four sights with the back sights, or getting the identification in the wrong place, you know, putting things in the same line. Um, but once the once I explained where to put them all. Um, it made a bit more sense, I think, to them.
Now they're just working out what the differences are. And I think once if everybody's got their brain round this, then I'll um, take the tachyometry shot to point A, using three hair stadia, and then we can see um, what distance is. But I think the discussion's going on are just sort of understanding how to book the information from it and when should you do it and I'm telling them that it, again you only use it once at the start of a job or when you hire a new instrument or you buy a new instrument you want to just check it's alright and then check it now and again to make sure it's good it shouldn't, you know, once you've got confidence in the instrument then you'll be able to use it all the time Still trying to explain the back sights and fore sights and why did we sight this one and not that one. And then the the error is so small that it's there's no need to do any more work in it. We can now use it to take levels anywhere. And so we can take we can leave the instrument where it was and take all the levels and the steps and the floors and the manholes and gullies and take the stuff up to where the staff is quite confident that there's not going to be a huge error and once we've done all the levelling round here then we can change on that station and go around the other side of the building and continue. I just wish I'd checked my level when it fell out of my pocket. It saved us um, or me trying to remember what was said, what was discussed. But as I say, the students should be able to um, fill in and some of them. And then we're trying to talk about height of collimation, which is the position that the level is above the ground. Because people think it needs to be, you need to know what it is where you don't. A level can be set up anywhere, providing it's levelled then that height of the collimation is referenced from your start point, your back sight, plus what you read on the staff. So you've got the level at the start point, plus what you read on the staff is the height of collimation. And it's noted on the um, booking, paid, booking forms how you work out your height of collimation and how you work out your reduced level. I'm probably discussing about taking levels everywhere. Well, it is because there's no problem with the two, mi two millimeter error will not give you any great problems in taking levels where they're meant to be. Stadium to see if it gives us the distance that we think it will. I think that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to take the bottom here, the top here, and the middle here. The middle here will give you the level, the bottom here and the top here, take one from the other, so the bottom here is 1.315 the middle here is 1.430 and the top here is 1.546 and I'm going to deduct the bottom from the top and see what the distance is and then now looking through it to understand the other two crosshairs. You get the big one through the middle, which is your level, and then the other two are used to calculate distances. 
So once everybody's had a look, we'll access the tape and we'll um, measure it. And as I say, it can be used for um, using the three hair stadia, the tachyometry, and using the angle once you've established the reference then you can take the angle and the distance and plot all your levels on your soft areas and other details. And you could use it for manos, centre of manos, the centre of gullies, soft areas. Um, because what it will do is it will give you confidence that you've measured in your gullies and manos in the right place. Because if you do trilateration or um, chain and offset and position them, and then you use the three hair stadia, to give you a level on them and fix the positions. Hopefully, the angles and the distances will put it within 100 mil of the um, where it should be. And certainly on the um, on the gullies, you might end up with um, something that's that may be over the gully, or it might just be off it. But it's 100 mil accuracy you're getting because you can only read to one millimeter and one millimetre times a hundred gives you the error of um, 0.1 so the best you're going to get is 0.1 I'm oh, pretty soon I'll go and get the level I mean the tape, tape distance from point A. Oh, there we go. So if you can hold the end of it in point A, and I'll hold it underneath the assumed centre of the instrument. Straighten it up, be giving it a little pull, make sure it's flat. And I measure it at, I calculated 23.1, because at 1315, take away from 1546 gives you 23.1. Uh, the five mil from the six mil, and then the one uh, ten, one centimetre away from four centimetres is three, and then three decimeters from five decimeters is two. So it's twenty three point one zero zero, and it was actually spot on. So the centre of the instrument is twenty three point one, um, which is, which means it was read correctly, and it's level and. It just shows you that it is possible to use it successfully um, to give you distances. The angles you'd need to get used to because it's you've got the degrees and I think it's you need to interpolate the minutes. So you've got a very small space, I think it's about a millimetre, so you've got 20, uh, 40 and 60, which would be a whole minute. So you interpolate as best you can the angle, so you'll get the degrees and you get the minutes. You certainly won't get any less than that. Um, but it'd be good enough for a protractor on a drawing with a scale rule and position levels with this method. And that is providing you fix the instrument position either by a plumb bob over a nail or by using distances, I trilateration or chaining offset to position where the level is, then you'd reference an RO, a reference object, on a known point. And it can be a manhole, it can be a corner of the building, it can be a fence point, it can be anything. As long as you know what it is and you can fix it, that is your reference. So when you plot it on the drawing, you'd have the point where the instrument is, the reference object, which is your RO, and you'll have a distance to that, um, because you put the staff up against it, so you can confirm that with its position, and then you'll have the angle to your level points, which you're then going to use the protractor, and then you level out using a scale rule.
to position the levels. And you can do an awful lot with it. And the alternative is that you'd set out a small grid. So the bit of grass between where we're talking and the iPad, if you wanted to do that because you didn't want to use tachyometry, then you could fix by ranging poles and bamboo canes one end of it, pull out five meter intervals, you know, so five, 10, 15 meters, put another pole in, fix the two ends of that by chaining offset or trilateration. And then you can um, use the double, op the double prism optical square to square off 90 degrees to your other points. Um, and then you can measure the five meter intervals between that put in bamboo canes and then level them, one, two, three, four, five, mark them on your drone. And then when you get back to the office to put it on the drone, you just need to fix the two ends of the grid, the square or the rectangle. And once you've processed and reduced your levels, you just write next to level point number one, this is the level, point number two, this is the level. So that's the other way of doing it. And then you'd have extra levels on your thresholds, gullies, manholes and all the rest of it so it becomes quite achievable and certainly somebody was concerned about how do you fix it all so this is me showing that you'd have a point here a point over there form your grid and um, fix the two ends of it um, and then you can um, level it easily so you've you've leveled half the site um, with not a huge amount of setting up and once you've then gone along the centre line of the paths and the roadways at five metre intervals, taking the edge, the crown, or the top of the camber, and then the other side, and then a level in the top of the grass, you've ended up starting to uh, fill in the drawing with lots of levels. So it's quite an easy thing to use. And you've got the facility, if you buy one, that you can use it for level, use it like a theodolite, and use it for levels and position. And there is user instructions in the handouts under, I think it says using a level um, as a theodolite. So it's all quite easy to work with. And then I think we um, were just discussing um, other bits about levelling and how far. And somebody was saying that they had a, the recent job, I think it was the Cheshire and Boice one, uh, the one you're actually using at the moment as a test piece. Um, the contours do not go right up to the, um, the hedge or the boundaries. And what I'm explaining is that... Um, the level coverage is not giving you that. Um, and you need to have, you know, if the, if the computer or the individual has drawn the contours, there's not enough information on it, then it can't continue the contour. And I think somebody just asked me a minute ago, can they use the hedge um, to give them the difference in height? But the top of the hedge is not very good because it's rough. Um, but certainly give you an idea if you measured the height of it at 2.2 or 2.5 metres, then measured the other end, and they've cut it at the same height all the way through, then you can establish a different height. But it's certainly a hedgerow is not, not something I would use. Walls and fences, yes, but probably not a hedgerow. So we're just discussing various about um, what you can achieve um, yourself and whether it would be best to bring in professionals to do the work. And certainly by bringing in professionals is the easiest, but if your client's not going to want to pay for it um, and there's not enough money in the budget and you're unhappy or um, you don't want to take the risk of trying to do the survey yourself, you could ask the survey company to come in and if you've measured everything so you've measured the building you've measured the fences you've measured the pathways and the sheds and what have you flower beds then you can bring in or ask a surveyor would you give us a cost just to put levels everywhere and they may want to do it but certainly individuals small outfits 
would, may want to do it, but not large companies because they would probably want to do the whole survey. But you could get somebody to say, give me a level coverage, five metre level coverage, level and um, the pathways, the roadways, and the gullies, and the manholes, and um, you can then add them, or they can give you a drawing based on what you've surveyed already, and you then get in a complete drawing. And it will certainly be less price. It won't be so costly, um, or lesser price. But um, as I say, you might struggle to find somebody to come in for that small amount of work. It's much better if you can find somebody, a local chap or somebody you know, who can give you, um, you know, a bit of work quite easily without too much involvement. But I still think that the buying a level or higher in it um, is useful because it can last for years and you can make use of it as just to check things. So you've had your survey de delivered, somebody's done one and you want to check it's good. But the, I think somebody was asking, you know, they can guesstimate things, and if you find out that things are wrong, would you, would you end up having arguments? Well, of course, if you undermine somebody, but they will get the idea that you know more about what you're letting on, because you can understand that you've had the, le you've bought the level, you've done some checks, and you found out something's 150 mil out. And if they accept that, then they'll say, "Blimey, you! This this person knows knows their onions." Um, so you could end up a conflict, or they could appreciate that you they can't pull the wool over your ears, over your eyes, or over your ears. Um, so yes, people can estimate levels and differences in height quite easy if they've got a lot of experience. And um, certainly, they would look at down that corner up there and just visually I would say that it's the rise in the earth up in the corner over there was um, going up three or four hundred mil and I think on the survey drawing that I've done it said 275 mil so it's about there and distance wise because we're about 23 well it was 23.1 meters from the instrument to the level staff to the um, to the wall is probably 45 meters so you can quickly estimate things and you'll get more and more experience as you go on where you can um, you know, work out the differences in height whether it be from the hedge or whether it be from just looking around it but certainly lining up things is helpful to check and prove the survey and you're not trying to find holes all the time what you want to try and find is some confidence that you know what you're doing and the survey that you have that you have received or inherited is up to the job because you don't want to do a lot of design and find out that you know this 50 mil or 100 mil here is giving you a real knees up yeah so I think that's almost about it we're just sort of wrapping up saying about um, people who are probably going to bring in professionals but they can help each other. You know, if somebody had takes on a little survey, then they can ask one of the other students with the mind helping them. So between the two of them, you can do quite a bit. But certainly the levelling is probably a two-man exercise where you need two people, to one to read it and book it, and the other one to hold the staff. Um, and then they can hold a bit of tape. You can draw up your plan from your measurements, your boundaries, put a few levels over it and before you know it you've got a fairly robust survey that you can use um, to do your preliminary design from. But as I say that the discussions that are going on at the moment this is the gist of it and um, if the students can comment over and above this to the other ones online and um, was there anything I missed? Um, but basically it was just general chat about accuracies, levels, what would a surveyor do, what would he charge, what confidence have you got doing stuff yourself, and um, whether you got the knowledge and the goods to do the survey. I think we're just wrapping things up now anyway, so... Um, 
and you're maybe talking about reference object, objects if you're going to use tachyometry. But I think it's a good investment, a level. A level, one with a circle on it that you can read the angles, a level staff and a tripod. And if you have a couple of types, then you're away, really. And you can certainly do the basics um, with, um, along with purchasing ProMap, a map, you know, Ordnance Survey Maps from ProMap and Google, map, Google Maps and doing a bit of survey yourself with the level. You can go, and you're only talking about a few hundred quid. Um, then what comes to play is the time and the confidence. And if your client doesn't want to pay for you to survey their land, then you're going to have to do and talk to them and say, well, I can do so much myself, but I don't want to spend weeks because somebody's got to pay for that time. Or well, you bring in a professional to do a bit of work to enhance yours. Um, and again, you've got to be prepared to put up with the any differences because, you know, there might be the 100 mil here and there, but providing it doesn't affect the accuracy and what you're trying to do, then it should be fine. Look as if they're all doing little dances a minute ago. I think that's about it. This might be the contour bits then. He's talking about where the contours were coming, why they weren't going up to the fence. Um, and I'm saying if there's not any levels within the, the hedgerow, then there's no way that a contour can be established. So, you know, if they've done one there, one there, one in there, there's no way that you can interpolate what's going on. You've got the alignment from the drawing so you can then extend it into the boundary so you've got the you've got a guide on your plan on the plan that you're doing is a test survey that it can be extended into the boundary or the underneath the hedge so you can get round things and again it's looking at it intelligently finding out what's right what's wrong what do you, but certainly the contours being yellow are a real pine and I've now made them blue and purple and I think the blue one's the intermediate and the purple ones are accentuated and they're normally every fifth. Um, so it should be much better for you to read. And I'll make sure that Marco um, is aware of it, that I've uploaded it. And I think this is everybody now saying bye-bye. Um, they're going to get the tripods and the staff and somebody's going to get me an iPad. And that's it. And we'll move everything inside. So thanks very much. It's just a shame I dropped my phone and stopped the... Um, initial video but at least we covered it all. Cheers now, bye bye.